Okay, and, and everybody uh, knows that uh, we're talking about universalism today. And for those of you that are not real sure what universalism is, by the end of this talk, you ought to. <laughs> you ought to understand it perfectly. Let's start in prayer. Uh, our God, it would be heaven to perfectly please you and to be all that you would have us to be. We fervently hope that we, we could be as holy as you are holy and as pure as Christ is pure and perfect as your spirit is perfect. But we find it so easy to break your law. And we don't. We want to do what's right, but we find ourselves not really doing that. We, we do the very thing we're actually determined not to do. And we delight in your word with all our heart, yet we find ourselves so easily turned aside from it. How can we live this way when you're infinite in grace and goodness towards us? We cry with the Apostle Paul, who will help me? Who will, who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. You're rich in mercy, washing away the sins of those who belong to you and declaring them righteous. Because of, your, of our precious Savior, Jesus Christ, we can stand before you like a child beloved by their father. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound it saved a wretch like us. Our true hope is set on the grace that will be brought to us when Jesus Christ is revealed. Oh, for the day that would, it would be soon. God of grace, grant us the heart and the mind to turn away from sin. We want to be holy in all of our thoughts and actions for your, for your name's sake. Amen. Now, a long time ago, I read an article about universalism. And it, I remember it because it was, it was just so unbelievable uh it's a it's a theological view uh it's it's called also it's called universalism or universal reconciliation and uh it's become attractive to many christians as a result of modern views about the way that, the way that people look at justice and love and because some of the people that they love, like their children or their grandchildren, don't believe in Christ. But how does, how does the philosophical and theological basis of universalism stand up against a comparison of Scripture? And my conclusion was that universalism was dangerous. And why is that? Because if Christians teach that eventually everyone will have eternal life, then the need for conversion isn't necessary, and evangelization is is it's replaced by a greater focus on justice and social liberation from poverty and oppression in our present life on earth, and it leads to a, a social gospel becoming more important than the Christian gospel of salvation by grace through faith in. In, in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The result is there's no need for repentance, no need to seek forgiveness from God, and, and less of a desire to attend church. Not only are there huge numbers of Christians who go along with this view, but the idea that everybody goes to heaven when they die is now very popular with non-Christians as well making it harder to evangelize. Hi! There's three types of a basic argument that's used to support universalism. And the first one is philosophical, where it's argued that as God is love, he must love all his created beings, not just some. So they, they reason there that he must want all of them to have eternal life, and as he's all-powerful, he will, he will make that happen. Some argue that this would overwrite their free will, but see, some people, other people respond that after resurrection, once people have had time to fully understand what God offers, all of them will freely accept this as they would be irrational not to. See, I don't intend to go down this rabbit hole because there is, is no... Uh, biblical basis for this view. Yes, I am, ma'am. Yes, uh, 
there's no biblical basis for this at all yes ma'am I'm, I'm recording so and there's also theological arguments where uh, there, there, there's a whole bunch of them. They're real varied, but they all boil down to an argument about divine love and are similar to this argument that, that I discussed just now. The problem with this is that it's assumed that all people in the next life will eventually freely respond to God's love. However, free will includes the freedom to ultimately reject God in His love. And this could be for a lot of different reasons, including uh, contention uh, that he doesn't exist in this life or, or that his nature is not all loving because of suffering. A lot of people don't believe that God is a God of love uh, because uh, there's people in this life who don't believe that, that God exists and others who never hear or maybe don't understand the gospel message. And this leads some believers to argue that, that those people will have a second chance to believe after they die, and so eventually they will accept his love. And, and we'll look at this, this uh, today too. And third, there's biblical arguments that are based on certain passages in the Bible that universalists believe support their view. And these are the arguments that we'll look at in more detail. Uh, so the theological argument for universalism is the idea that all will be given eternal life, and and it it really started like in the in the second century, and and it, it had wide traction in the fourth century, and then it kind of kind of it hit the uh, the boondocks. It didn't get in mainstream Christianity until probably again in the 17th in the in the rational age. So, George MacDonald, who lived in the 19th century, was one of those who was never able to agree with, with the version of Calvinism that had per pervaded Scotland at the time that he lived. And he couldn't believe, like strict Calvinists did, that a God of love selected only certain people to receive his love and forgiveness, his righteousness, and ultimately eternal life. Whereas, on the other hand, he didn't uh, those he didn't select would ultimately burn in hell for eternity. He, he, it was their particular misunderstanding of the doctrine of predestination among the Calvinists, and, and actually it was God's omniscience, but that's digressing, in Scripture that he objected to and which upset him. So it was taught that only some were predestined to believe in God, and and it was these who were saved by grace through faith. And, and this, is, this is a typical Calvinistic view. Uh, you know, that's part of the tulip, uh, the unconditional uh, election. So, and, and I'm kind of with MacDonald there. I, I don't believe that is a proper biblical understanding. But, uh, on the other hand, he believed that those not chosen would, would suffer God's wrath for eternity. He didn't, he didn't believe that. He didn't believe that an all-loving God could possibly act in such a way. Instead, he saw that God's love and forgiveness was available to everybody, to all mankind. And so he believed that eventually all would be given eternal life. See? Universalism. And, and that view was thought to be supported by a number of scriptures that we're going to look at today. Well... Pretty soon, some prominent the theologians also began to reject the idea of eternal punishment and damn damnation for unbelievers, and instead, they began to teach different forms of universalism. And the, and the most popular one, I know you've heard of him, Karl Barth, lived in 1886 to 1968, who was a Reformed theologian from Switzerland. He taught that all human beings were both damned and elected in Christ, and that the punishment took place on the cross. He taught that we have a reason to hope that all will be saved because there's always more grace in God than sin in us. But we can't say that all are saved. Others who were influenced by him took it a step further and, and concluded that his logic pointed to universalism. In the 20th century, there was a theologian and philosopher, John Hick, who wrote Evil and the God of Love in 1977. And he was, he was a big proponent of universalism. 
uh, not as an alternative, alternative to suffering in hell, but as the only credible response to the problem of evil and suffering in this present life. And he maintained that it's only possible to believe in a God of love if ultimately all are saved to eternal life. Now, maybe this was because he reasoned that in eternal life, God could, could then make up for all the suffering that people experienced in this life. This, this is, in fact, true for all of believers. As in Romans 8.18, Paul, uh, he voiced a similar thought. I consider that in our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be re revealed in us. And, and more, more recently, there was a man uh, named Paul Young who wrote to Shack. You may be familiar with this. He expressed those views a little differently. He described himself as a hopeful universalist. This is because he believed that since God loves everybody and intends to give everyone eternal life, then it's logical that he will save everybody. He believed that this is possible because God sent his son, Jesus, to die on the cross for every single sinner without exception, and therefore God would reconcile every sinner to himself. The theological question, though, remains in that, Although Scripture does teach that Christ died for all, does this imply that everybody receives eternal life? And, and we're going to look at this, this important question in, in a little bit, too. Uh, I want to throw in something right here, right now. Not everybody believes, and that's supported in the Bible, but we'll go over that. Now, this is, this is one of the biggest proponents of universalism. Rob Bell. In 2011, Rob Bell wrote Love Wins, and he was, he was, they said that he was putting forth a new vision of God's love for all when he questioned the, the Orthodox Christian view that not everybody's saved and not everyone will receive eternal life. Now, his, Rob Bell's distinguishing brand of universalism included the belief that after death, people are given as many chances as they need to accept God's love and forgiveness, so that eventually all will have eternal life because all will finally accept that, however long it takes. But <laughs> there's no scriptures that support this particular view, and we're not going to be looking at this any further. <laughs> it's, it's, it's ludicrous. So, we ha still have this problem of judgment and eternity in hell that we got to look at. Now, one of the difficulties is that certain branches of Christianity teach that an all-loving God is to judge mankind and will cast those who don't believe in, in Him into a hell of torment for eternity. Now, to solve this problem, some adopt universalism. If everybody, everybody received eternal life, then the logical deduction was that no one would suffer in hell for eternity. Now, there's a, there's a few scriptures that, if you look at them a certain way, would seem to suggest that, but we're going to go over those. Uh, so, it gained, that idea gained popularity. And uh, we need to look at the problem, as some people see it, of unbelievers being judged by God and being tormented in hell for eternity. Was this a correct understanding of Scripture? Now, when we look at this question, it's helpful first to understand that there's a big difference in Scripture between God's judgment of believers and His judgment of unbelievers. Believers, have they're assessed at the, at the judgment seat. You may know it as the Bema seat. Uh, we're not condemned because it's Romans 8, 1 through 2. As Christians, we're not condemned. Let me clarify that. Uh, Romans 8, 1 and 2 tells us there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit of life set us free from the law of sin and death. And John three eighteen says, Whoever believes in Him is not condemned. However, Scripture also does tell us that all believers will appear before the judgment seat of Christ on the day of resurrection when Christ returns. There's two passages in Scripture that refer to this judgment seat of Christ, which explain that it's for the purpose of giving an account of our lives and our service for them. And, and if you're a member of 
Faith Chapel. We have discussed this extensively over the past few weeks. Uh, rewards for our works in life. So, John 3.18 says, Whoever believes in him is not condemned. So, we have to give our life an account for our lives and our services for him. Uh, Romans 14, 10 through 12 says, You then, why do you bro judge your brother? Or why do you look down on your brother? For we will all stand before God's judgment seat. It's written, As surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me and every tongue will confess to God. So then each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. That's what Romans 14, 10 through 12 tell us. If you look in your note card, there's a little arrow pointing at that particular, those particular scriptures in the margin. So, but, but we all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one of us may receive what is due to them for things done while in the body, whether good or bad, as 2 Corinthians 5.10. Now, the Greek word translated judgment seat here is the bema, and, and uh, vines says it's used to denote a raised place or a platform reached by steps where there's a place of assembly from uh, which the platform or orations were made or speeches and the word came to be used for a tribune for a, a magistrate or a judge uh, two of which were provided in the particular law courts of Greece one for the accuser and one for the defendant and so it was also used in a tribunal in, in the New International Version, Bema is translated court in Acts 18, 12, 16, and 17. And Paul uh, brought before, when he, Paul was brought before uh, Gallio, the proconsul of Archaea, and in Acts 25, 6, 10, and 17, Paul's trial before Festus at Caesarea. And it's also translated judge's seat in Matthew 27, 19, when Pilate was sitting on the judge's seat. And John 19, 13, when Jesus was brought before Pilate, who sat on the judge's seat. So here, in these two passages, the judgment seat of Christ is likened to a Greek court, where there would have been two tribunes, one as an accuser and one as a defender. However, in this divine tribunal for believers, Christ is both the righteous judge and the Lamb of God, which would be the sacrifice for sin. So, all of those who have accepted him as their Savior, there's no case to be heard. The righteous judge sees that that price has been paid by the blood of the Lamb, and so the penalty for the sins has been canceled. The sinner is given righteousness through Christ and can go on to eternal life. These two different roles of Christ are clearly seen in the following two scriptures, 2 Timothy 4, 7 and 8. Paul, uh, he refers to Christ as the righteous judge. He says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to, to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearance. That's y'all. <laughs> That's for me. John one twenty nine refers to Christ as the Lamb of God. And the next day saw, saw Jesus coming, uh, John saw Jesus coming towards him, and he said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So, so as, a, as a summary here, on the day of assessment, each believer will stand before Christ, and for each one he will declare, There's no case. Their sin is covered by the blood of the Lamb. All that, all that remains to be seen is, is which one of our deeds, which of our deeds done while we're still on earth would maybe earn us a reward, and, or which requires burning up. Jesus mentions this when he talks to the disciples about his impending death in Matthew 16, 27. For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what he has done. 1 Corinthians 10-15 through 15 explains it in a little bit more detail how this assessment happens. By the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as an expert builder, and someone else is building on it. But each one should be careful how he builds, for no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If any man 
builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, his work will be shown for what it is, because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each man's work. If what he has built survives, he will receive his reward. If it's burned up, he will suffer loss. He himself will be saved, but only as one escaping through the flames. So on the day of resurrection, when Christ returns, a believer's work for the Lord will be assessed, and a reward will be given for the gold, silver, and costly stones, but the worthless wood and hay and straw will be destroyed permanently. All that will be left for eternity will be the good. Each believer will receive a reward for whatever they've done for the Lord during their life on earth. Anything worthless will have been destroyed. So, while believers are raised and assessed at the Bema seat at Christ's return, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 51 and 52, and 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, unbelievers are raised after Christ's millennial kingdom has run its course 1,000 years later. Uh, we see that in Revelation 25 and 7. And then they're judged at the great white throne, which we see in Revelation 20, uh, verse 11. Here believers are judged according to what they had done in Revelation 20:12. 20, then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. Earth and sky fled from his presence and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne and the books were opened. Another book was opened and the book of, book of life. The dead were judged. Uh, the word for judgment there is krino. And I left a, a, a great exposition. Uh, interpretation of that for you in your note card according to what they had done as recorded in the books the sea gave up the dead that were in it and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them and each person was judged again that word crino according to what he had done then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire the lake of the lake of fire is the second death if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life he was thrown into the lake of fire Revelation 20, 11 through 15. Now here the Greek word krino is used for judgment. Vine uh, says that this means, among other things, to assume the office of a judge, to give sentence, to condemn, and to execute judgment upon. That's a lot for one little four-letter word, ain't it? Uh, but it's often translated condemn, and it's used in a lot of pat passages that refer to the judgment of sin. One of the most famous passages using that word for this type of judgment is John 3:16 through 18. For God so loved the world that he gave his only only one and only son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn crino the world but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned that word crino but whoever does not believe or stands condemned. Same word. Already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. See, this, this word crino is never used when we're talking about believers. God's purpose in sending Jesus Christ into the world was not to judge or condemn, but to save the world from sin and death through his substitutional death on the cross. But this passage from Revelation, we quoted above, raises a number of issues. And the first one is that it seems some people who do not believe in Christ in this life are to have their names written in the book of life because of what they have done. One supposes the good that they had done. And, and some object to this on two grounds. Firstly, Paul states, we're saved by grace through faith, not works, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. But this word saved is never used of these people in Revelation 2015. They, they just have their names written in the book of life. And secondly, some state that eternal life is available only through Christ, and that is true. However, even in Revelation 20, 11 through 15, it is true, for here is Christ who does the judging of the works, and he alone decides whose names are to be written in the book of life. We know this because Christ himself in John chapter 5 referred to the second resurrection and to this judgment of works. 
In John 5, 20, 24 through 27, he speaks on the first resurrection of believers, those who hear his voice at, at his return. And then he went on to speak of the second resurrection and the judgment of unbelievers. He's, in John 5, 28 and 29, if you want to follow along, do not be amazed at this, for a time is coming when all who are in, their ground, uh, in the graves will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good will rise to live, and those who have done evil will rise to be condemned. Now, we don't know what good it is that people have to do to have their names written in the book of life. That's up to Christ. He is a righteous judge, and, and we, on, on, uh, on the other hand, are told not to judge. Now, returning to the passage in, in Revelation 20 that we quoted above, it speaks about death and hell being cast into the lake of fire. And then we read of the creation of the new heavens and the new earth where there will be no more crying or pain in Revelation 21.4. So eternal torment would be impossible. However, there is one verse that talks about torment day and night forever and ever in, in the New in an International Translation, it says, And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown. They will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Revelation 20.10 Now, this, this tells us about the devil, the beast, and the false prophet being tormented in the lake of fire. But see, this is limited in time as the literal translation of forever and ever is until the age of the ages. Have you ever heard that? You know what it means? Let's look at that. The age of the ages is the supreme age, just like the king of kings is the supreme king. The supreme age is the creation of the new heavens and the new earth, when there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. So these three beings are to be tormented only until then for a limited time. The difference between the, the believer's judgment, the assessment, and the un, unbeliever's judgment, uh, we see that it's significant in those, those two passages above that refer to the believer's assessment before God use a totally different Greek word, bema. And I know you all all know what that means, the judgment seat. To the word used for the uh, judgment of unbelievers, which is krino. See, it makes clear that they're entirely different. These two groups are entirely different. Christ assesses believers and rewards for their good deeds and eternal life. Even a cup of cold water given in Jesus' name has its reward, Matthew 10, 42. But anything worthless is burned up permanently. We cannot judge the way Jesus does because he knows a person's background and circumstances where where we just do not do not in his eyes the widow's two small coins were worth more than the large amounts of the rich people because they were all she had in mark 12:41 through 34 she gave everything but the rich didn't on the other hand according to john 3:18 unbelievers are condemned judged revelation 20:11 through 15 tells us that Christ judges them according to what they have done, and any of them whose name is not written in the book of life will perish. See John 3.16 for that. In the lake of fire, which is the second death, there is no everlasting torment mentioned. Instead, the lake of fire achieves total destruction. We see that in Revelation 20.14. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. After this, there is no more death. And it's made clear in that in Revelation 21.4. There will be no more death for the old order of things are, has passed away. Now, does this mean all unbelievers are thrown into the lake of fire? Not all. We're told that only those whose names are not written in the book of life are destroyed. And, and we're given examples in, in the, of that in Revelation 13.8. Those who worship the beast, and in Revelation 17, 8, uh, which would be just other inhabitants of the earth. There's no sp specific details there. But the Lord Jesus makes an, an important comment to the Jews who were, who were persecuting him in John chapter 5. For just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the Son gives life to whom he is pleased to give it. 
for the Father has life in himself. So, for as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to judge because he is the Son of Man. Do not be amazed at this, for a time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good will rise to live, and those who have done evil will rise to be condemned. This is John 5, 21, 26, and 29, through 29. Now, we note here again that it's Jesus who will judge all unbelievers who are raised at the great, great white throne. He'll judge them according to the good or the evil that they've done in this life. Those who he judges to have done good will live and will be given eternal life. They are those to whom the Son is pleased to give life and whose names will be written in the book of life. Those who have done evil will be condemned to the second death. We're not told the details of, of exactly what he considers to be good or evil, but we do know that he is a righteous judge. He'll judge that some are worthy of eternal life and that others are not. If we trust in the Lord's love and righteousness, we can rest assured that those who receive eternal life will deserve it. But we can rest assured that those that he judges to be evil do not. And, of course, these unbelievers who are raised at the great white throne were never saved in this life. They could be unbelievers for a lot of different reasons. Some people may have never heard the message, uh, such as those who lived in the far distant past, or those who have lived in places in the world in more recent times where the message has never reached. They could be children who died before they had a chance to understand or believe, or those with mental disabilities who were never able to understand that message. Or they could be those who have only heard a distorted version of the, of the gospel. Or maybe their circumstances uh, you know, made them reject the, the message. There's so many different people throughout the ages and throughout the world who have never had the privilege of hearing the, the message and understanding it and believing it. Yet God loved the world, and His all-encompassing love meant that He had provided a plan for everyone to receive eternal life if they wanted it or deserved it, or would have done so given the opportunity. Now God in His compassion and His righteousness is very aware of everybody's situation and Jesus will take all this into account when he makes his righteous judgment of unbelievers at the great white throne. Uh, there's a, a, let's look at some references that people use to support universalism. There's a number of passages. And uh, look at, look at, here's a verse from John's Gospel. I will draw all men to myself, John 12, 32. But I, when I'm lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself, John 30, 12, 32. Now, universalists say that this means Christ's death, death saved everybody rather than only those who believe. But this verse has to be understood in the, and this is the magical word here, context, context of the other verses in John's Gospel. For example, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him and I will raise him at the last day. That's John 6:44. So in John 12, 32, the all men there are those whom the Father has drawn, according to, to chapter 6, verse 44. It doesn't mean every person who's ever lived. It means all those who belong to a certain group of people who the Father had selected. How does the Father select his, this particular group of people? He selected those who believe, as we can see in these verses here. Yet there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus had known from the beginning which of them would not believe and would betray him. He went on to say, This is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled him. That's John 6, 6 64 and 65. Here, Jesus was referring back to his statement in verse 44, where we just quoted, So that no one could come to him unless the Father had drawn him or enabled them to do so, and the Father enabled them only if they believed. So God, look, John three sixteen through 18, For God so loved the world that he gave his only one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him, 
whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whosoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. John 3, 16 through 18. Now, God, he loves, he does, he, he, he loved the whole world. But in these verses, it's only those who believe that are mentioned as having eternal life. So, from that, it's clear that not everyone is given eternal life. But those who respond in faith to God's offer of righteousness and believe in Him do receive eternal life. These verses show that those who believe are drawn, and those who are drawn receive eternal life. Now, John 3.18 goes on to explain that those who do not believe stand condemned already and will be judged by their works at the great white throne. And likewise, in Romans 8.1, Paul says there's no condemnation for those who, who are in Jesus Christ, or Christ Jesus, which implies that there will be condemnation for those who are not in Christ Jesus. Instead of being raised at the first resurrection, they too will be judged at the great white throne. We have to understand that individual verses like John 12:32 need to be interpreted within the context of other scriptures, both in this gospel and other places. Otherwise, it's possible to misinterpret what's being said. Justification, Romans 5:12:18 18 and, through, and 19 says, Justification that brings life for all men. Now, let's look at Paul's letter to the Romans. Just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, and in this way death came to all men, because all sinned, so also the result of one act of righteousness was the justification that brings life for all men. For just as through the disobedience of that one man the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of one man the many will be made righteous. Romans 5, 12, 18, and 19. Now, some universalists, they'll tell you, well, that one act of righteousness brings that life for all men means that every single person is justified, made righteous by Christ's death on the cross and receives eternal life. Now, it may mean that that one act of righteousness makes life available to all men, but they would still need to take hold of it. As in John's Gospel, as here in Romans, we need to look at the wider context of what Paul wrote in that letter, and particularly by what he meant by all men. Now, earlier he wrote, uh, Paul referred uh, in Romans 4.22, to this underlying principle concerning righteousness, which starts back in Genesis chapter uh, chapter 15, verse 6, where we read, Abraham believed the Lord, and it was accredited to him as righteousness. Paul then goes on to say, God will credit righteousness for us who believe in him, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, whom, with, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. Romans 4, 24 to 5, chapter 5, verse 2. And earlier still, he had made it abundantly clear that this righteousness from God comes through faith in Christ Jesus to all who believe in Romans 3.22. We can see that earlier in his letter to the Romans that Paul had already explained that righteousness came to all those who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ and in Him who raised Him from the dead. This righteousness came from faith and gave access to eternal life. So in the next chapter 5, uh, all men refer to all those who put their, ch their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. The context of Paul's works, uh, words in chapter 5 have been given beforehand. And there's a lot of places in the Bible where they, there's, you see universal words like all, everyone, whatsoever, and the world are used with a limited meaning. For example, John 12, 19, the Pharisees said, See, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. And and see that the whole world here is the crowd of Jews that had gathered around followed following the raising of Lazarus. Matthew six thirty three. 
the Lord told the disciples, Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Now, from the context, all these things refers to food, drink, and clothing. All things in the Greek is, is tapanta. Ta is the Greek definite article, and its function is to limit the scope of all or every. every, every. Uh, so all things is universal, whereas the all things is limited by the context. So Paul says in Philippians 4.13, I can do everything through him which, who gives me faith, gives me strength. But in context, that shows that when he said this, he meant that he had learned how to be content no matter if he was hungry or well fed. He didn't mean that he could literally do every, anything. 1 Corinthians 15.22, Paul wrote, As in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. Now this is a commonly used verse to support universalism. But with as with the other verses we've considered in in just now this all is limited those who are in Christ are believers and and you will see later in that chapter uh, 1 Corinthians 15 where he states that we will not all sleep which means die in verse 51 and not all are made alive or resurrected as some uh, you know those believers who are alive when when Christ returns will be changed verses 51 and 52 and we can also see that in 1 Thessalonians 4, 15 and set through 17. Now John chapters 14, 15 and 16, there's many references to Christ telling them that they would have whatever, anything they asked in his name. Now the context does not say what the whatever and anything refer to. But it's clearly, he's not giving them a blank check, you know. And we can see from the following examples here. John 14, 13, and 14. And I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that in order that the Son may bring glory to the Father. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. Or John 15, 7. If you remain in me, and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be given you. John 15, 16 says, You did not choose me. But I chose you, and I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Then the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. Now, from the above passages in John, we learn that the, the things that the disciples asked for has to be the sort of things that will bring glory to the Father. Uh, those are conditional. If you remain in me, and my words remain in you. And, and are a direct consequence, those things that they're asking for, are a direct consequence of them bearing good fruit and lasting fruit. Neither did Paul receive everything he asked for. For example, he asked three times for this thorn in the flesh to be removed, and he was told no. 2 Corinthians 12, 7 through 9. In Romans, the word everyone is often limited to a, a, a clearly defined group of people. We we'll see, uh, for instance, in uh, Romans 1.16, the gospel brings salvation to everyone who believes. Uh, Romans 10.4, there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. And ten, uh, Romans 10.13, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So there's a lot of places where the word all and other universal words were actually used in a very specific context. And it's the same, same, as, same with us today isn't it? in everyday speech. You know, you, ask, uh, you, ask, uh, you may ask in, a, in the context of a group of people, are we all here? Or is everybody here? But we don't mean everybody in the world or everybody in the country or maybe even everybody in Second Life. We mean it within the confines of that particular group, and, and the people that you're asking know exactly who's included. Much of Romans chapter one, uh, uh, no, chapter three, and chapter four talks about justification by faith. So when we return to, to Romans 5, 12, uh, 18, and 19, which we quoted at the beginning of this section here. When Paul wrote that justification brought life to all men and that many will be made righteous, he had already made it clear that he meant all those who had faith in Christ. And we also see uh, in the reconciliation of all things, like in Colossians 1, 19 through 20, 
God was pleased to have his fullness, all his fullness dwell in him and through him, talking about Christ, to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Colossians chapter 1 verses 19 and 20. Now here all things is that great tapanta which we had earlier and as in those other places is best refer understood as all these things and the context shows that it includes things on heaven and on earth so we know that this doesn't refer to every spiritual uh, being and every human being revelation 20 10 through 15 it makes it pretty clear that the beast and the false prophet and the devil which are spiritual beings and those who are not written in the book of life human beings undergo the second death from which there is no resurrection Isaiah 26 14 talks about a, a group of people the Hebrew word is Rephaim who will not Rephaim am I pronouncing that right Sharan who will not rise from the dead and so there can be no reconciliation for them either so which humans are reconciled to God the verses from Colossians tell us that Christ is the means by which this reconciliation is possible. This is this is so because of what you know is said a little earlier in Colossians chapter one that Christ is the image of God. Christ is preeminent, being firstborn. Christ is the Creator. Christ holds everything together in verse seventeen, and Christ is fully God in verse nineteen. But see, Christ was also man. And because he was a man, he could sacrifice himself on the cross and pay that price that was necessary for redemption. In this way, he could reconcile all things to himself, including humanity. Now, not only this, but Ephesians 1.10, it alludes to the future where the times will have reached their fulfillment, when God will bring all things in heaven and on earth together under one head, even Christ. Now, we see this, this phrase again, all things it's used. And in that context, this future time refers to a new heaven and a new earth that we see in Revelation 21.1, the home of the righteous, as we see in 2 Peter 3.13. Now, those who are not given righteousness will not have a home here. The word reconciliation is also used in the next three verses in Colossians 1. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation if you continue in your faith. Colossians 1, 21 and 23. Now these verses explain that that reconciliation is dependent on faith. Without faith there is alienation. In Colossians 1.23, there's no doubt about the faith of these believers in Colossae. The word if here means since. If means since. Uh, and we see this also in Colossians 2.5. Having faith in Christ and his death and resurrection for our salvation, our redemption, and our future righteousness in eternal life are all part of being reconciled to God. These gifts of salvation and redemption and righteousness and eternal life and that, and that reconciliation with God are all a direct result of our putting our trust and faith in the Lord Jesus. I'm going to take another drink of water. <laughs> mm. Now, uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 and, uh, through 19 shows that it is in Christ who are a new creation and, and they're reconciled to God. It tells us in that uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 19, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting man's sins against them. And he has committed to us this message of reconciliation. Now the us refers to the Corinthian Christians and Paul in that in that message there so here again anybody in Christ is reconciled and saved from sin and death so these not in Christ are not now there's many other verses that also show all those in Christ are believers for example in Romans 16 Paul 
he, he greets a number of believers who are described as being in Christ. It's Romans 6, uh, 16, uh, verses 3, 7, and 9 and 10. And in verse 7, Paul says that his relatives, uh, Andronicus and, and Junius, were in Christ before he was, before he was converted. When Paul was not a believer, he was not in Christ. Reconciliation is open to everybody through the death of Christ, which we will consider in more detail pretty soon. Only those who accept this message through faith are in Christ and receive this reconciliation. Having been reconciled, we're saved from death to life through Christ's resurrection from death to life, and one day we too will be resurrected like Christ and appear with Him in glory. That's Colossians 3, 4. And Jesus tasted our death, tasted death for everybody. Uh, we see in Romans 2, 9. Now, there's a number of scriptures that make it clear that Jesus died for the sins of the whole world, and so He is able to grant eternal life to whoever He wishes. But we see this Hebrews 2 9. But we see Jesus, who was made a little, uh, which means for a little while, lower than the angels, now crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. Hebrews 2 9. For Christ's love compels us, because we're convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died uh, for them and was raised again. That's 2 Corinthians 5, 14 and 15. 1 John 2, 2 says he, talking about Jesus Christ, is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but for the sins of the whole world. Isaiah 53 uh, verse 6 tells us, We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned his own, to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Now, these verses, and, and a lot of others, make it clear that Jesus died for the sins of the whole world, although Isaiah probably had just the nation of Israel in mind when he wrote that. This makes salvation open to everyone. But the key is that they have to believe in Christ as their Savior, that He died and rose again for their justification. This is the part that you'll never hear a universalist say. They, they, they state that everyone in the world will be given eternal life whether they have faith or not. There are so many verses that refer to the requirement to have faith that it's difficult to understand how they can dismiss it so easily. And as we've seen, just simply reading John 3.16 uh, through 18 makes this very clear. And added to this, uh, universalists like to quote 1 Corinthians 15.22 as further evidence that everyone will be given eternal life. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. Now based on this verse, they say that all in Adam will die, so all in Christ will be made alive, and therefore all will have eternal life. But see, this, this verse has already been considered along with the phrase, in Christ, as an expression that refers only to believers. If we understand this verse in the context of the Corinthians to whom Paul was writing to, they would have understood it that it referred to, to, to those believers. And they were all believers. God wants, uh, let's see, First Timothy 2, chapter 2, verses 3 through 6. It says, God wants all men to be saved. It's uh, First Timothy 2, 3 through 6. This is good and pleases God our Savior, who wants all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all men, the testimony given in its proper time. Now, this is another popular passage with universalists. They say that because God wants all men to be saved, they will be. The verse below, uh, let's see here, 2 Peter 3, 8, and 9, uh, it says, Do not forget this one thing, <clears throat> dear friends. With the Lord a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping His promises. Some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. 
But you see, in both of these verses, the Lord is wanting everybody to be saved and, and not wanting anybody to be, perish is not the same as everybody actually being saved. As we've seen over and over again, there has to be faith to be saved. If we look at this at the context of John 3.16, it makes it really clear. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life, eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. So God sent Jesus into the world specifically to offer salvation to the world through him. And that's the same as 1 Timothy and 2 Peter. But this comes immediately after it making it clear that salvation is dependent upon belief in him. Finally, 1 Timothy 4.10 says, We have put our hope in the living God who is the Savior of all men and especially of those who believe. Now, there's a clear difference between all men and those who believe. <laughs> you know, Jesus is the Savior of all men of the whole world. We can see that in John 4.42 and, and 1 John 4.14. But they need to believe in him. Now, earlier in John, in 1 John, uh, oh, let's see, in John, first, first John, first John, Paul said that the Savior wanted all men to be saved, but he adds a word, especially of those who believe. Believers are singled out for being special. This is because those who have faith are saved and, and are given righteousness and eternal life, where those who do not have faith and reject the message of salvation are judged at the great white throne. Now, Philippians uh, chapter 2, verses 9 through 11, tell us, uh, Therefore God exalted him to the highest place, and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. That's Philippians 2, verses 9 through 11. Now, uh, a, a short while back in this message, uh, we quoted a similar passage from Romans in the context of the believer's assessment at the Bema. You then, why do you judge your brother? Or why do you look down on your brother? For we all stand before God's judgment seat. It is written, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me, every tongue will confess to God. And so each of us will give an account of himself to God. That's Romans 14, 10 through 12. Now, these verses where Paul quotes are from Isaiah chapter 45, verses 23 and 24, that look forward to the Lord's return and the assessment of all believers at the judgment seat, the Bema. It says, Before me every knee will bow and every tongue will swear. They will say of me, In the Lord alone are righteousness and strength. That's Isaiah 45, 23 and, verses 23 and 24. Now, likewise, in the verses in, in Philippians, Paul, he, he, he refers to these same verses from Isaiah, uh, which in Romans clearly refer to the assessment of all believers at Christ's return. Therefore, in, in Philippians, the word every has to be understand to, you know, has to be understood to mean every believer, not every person who ever lived. It's context, context, you know, got to keep it in context. So this verse cannot be used to support the idea of universal reconciliation. All right, let's wrap this up. It's clear from Scripture that not everybody's going to have eternal life. It is believers who are saved by grace through faith in Christ's death on the cross and His resurrection and who are given righteousness and eternal life. Now, on the day of assessment at the judgment seat of Christ, each believer will stand before him, and for each one he will declare that there's no case against them. Their sin is covered by his blood. All that remains to be seen is which of their deeds done on earth merit a reward and which are going to be burned up. For unbelievers after death, God doesn't have to wait for he's, He doesn't wait forever trying to persuade them to accept his, his offer as some universalists suggest today. Nor does he turn a blind eye to their actions while they're here on earth. 
Instead, there's a final judgment for all unbelievers at the great white throne. They're judged by Christ according to what they have done, and those whose names are not written in the book of life will be cast into the lake of fire, which is the second death. But it seems like Christ in his mercy will judge that some of these should receive eternal life. And the names of these are written in the book of life. Christ is the righteous judge. And, and we honestly, we're not in a position to question that. We're told not to judge. And then in the new heaven and the new earth, there will be no more death, no mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things have passed away. Revelation 21.4 uh, listen, just before we finish, there may be somebody here who doesn't know Jesus. And this would be a great day for you to get saved, a great day to have for you to have a relationship with Jesus. And, and you know, it, I'd love for you to have, come after service and talk to me or, or talk with somebody else in here about what it means to follow Christ and to walk with Him and to have a life connected to God with purpose in your life. And, and you know, I know everybody in, in Faith Chapel would love to, you know, uh, help you with that let's uh he'll you know he'll forgive all your iniquities and he'll draw you to victory let's pray blessed holy spirit how appropriate to be meditating on the very last command in the bible come thirsty ones desiring ones come and take the free gift of the water of life uh from the you know from the day that you first convinced us of our need for Jesus and gave us faith to trust him, we've had an unquench unquenchable thirst for the water of life. The bitter waters of sin only make us sick. Fortunately, the deceiving waters of our broken cisterns satisfy ever so briefly. And these illusionary waters of countless mirages are just that, illusions. We've paid for all of these waters dearly, but the water Jesus gives is free so once again we bring our thirst to you we're thirsty to know jesus better and better we're thirsty to be to be quicker in our repentance and slower in our excuses we're thirsty to grow more of your fruit and less of our thorns we're thirsty to be freer to love other people as jesus loves us slake these thirsts by the water of the gospel we're thirsty for the new heaven and the new earth and we're thirsty for that wedding feast of the lamb when the bride will no longer say come but will say we're all here all of us we're thirsty for the day when God's glory will cover the earth as the waters covered the sea. We're thirsty for that day of no more thirst. We have no doubt that you will satisfy all of these thirsts. We pray in the fullness and faithfulness of Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. That was great. All right. And, you know, uh, Monday and Tuesday I'll be given a, a literally verse by verse through the Bible, and uh, on, on both of those days, it'll probably take maybe an hour each day. I hope it'll take 45 minutes, <laughs> but, but it will get through it, you know, if, if you want to, uh, if you want to, you know, witness to a, a universalist, you know, it really helps to know these things, but the, the key, the key when you're dealing with a universalist is not everybody believes. That's the key. Thanks for coming, Lear. That was great. That was excellent. So, thank you very much. I had good Cooper. material. Yeah. <laughs> so, very good. Very, very good. So, uh, what's the difference between what you're doing Monday and Tuesday and what we just had today? Like, are you going to cover it all? Sorry.